God bless you. Good morning, everyone. So glad that you came to worship with us today. If you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn with me to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we're going to talk about five reasons we must dare to discipline. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. While you find your way there, a uh, couple of quick things for you. First of all, I want to thank you for everyone who was part of our missions weekend last weekend. Thank you for everyone who participated and for everyone who gave a pledge to missions giving. Uh, our pledge total so far for missions giving for the coming year is $235,000. So we give thanks to the Lord. That is almost double what our pledges were last year. And uh, I don't know whether everybody caught it. Uh, some folks caught it. Some folks didn't. But what Bishop Chankersing committed to do was to go home to his congregation, and he is going to raise $30,000, and he is going to send that to us uh, for us to distribute to our missionaries. And so uh, that brings our missions uh, pledges so far to 260 something thousand dollars. And uh, we just give thanks to the Lord for that. That is amazing. And uh, if you didn't make a missions pledge, but you'd like to, there are missions pledge cards out on the Welcome Center. You can take one of those and just pray over what the Lord would have you do for missions. And then I just want to thank you for all your prayers. Thank you for all your giving for our Phase 2 Sanctuary and our Jump In Capital Campaign. Uh, we are scheduled to begin excavating the foundation of Phase 2 next week, the week of December 1st. Uh, the, uh, yeah, that's good. <laughs> The lawyers are still tinkering with the contracts with our excavator, and so it's a short week this week, and so we're hoping that they'll be able to finish all their work, and we are on the schedule right now for starting uh, right after Thanksgiving, week of December 1st, so thank you for your prayers, thank you for your giving, and uh, anything that you can do between now and the end of the year to help us towards phase two would just be a tremendous help as we dig in and as we get going. And I just want to remind you, please do drive slowly. We put some signs out there to help you remember. So please drive slowly around the campus because uh, we almost had uh, a few folks have fellowship out in the parking lot of the kind that we don't want. So, all right, look with me in 1 Corinthians 5, beginning in verse 1. Five reasons we must dare to discipline. 1 Corinthians 5, beginning in verse 1. Paul says, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that the pagans don't even tolerate. A man is sleeping with his father's wife and you are proud. Shouldn't you rather have gone into mourning and have put out of your fellowship the man who has been doing this? For my part, even though I'm not physically present with you, I am with you in spirit. As one who is present with you in this way, I have already passed judgment in the name of our Lord Jesus on the one who has been doing this. So when you are assembled and I'm with you in spirit and the power of the Lord Jesus is present, hand this man over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh so that his spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord. Your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little yeast leavens the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast so that you may be a new unleavened batch as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the festival of unleavened bread, not with the old bread of malice and wick wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral or greedy or swindlers or idolaters. In that case, you would have to leave this world. There's an LOL after that line. <laughs> but now I'm writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister, but is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater or slanderer, a drunkard or swindler. Do not even eat with such people. What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside. Expel the wicked person from among you. You're going to hear a sermon on a passage of scripture you have never heard a sermon on before, and it's going to be good. So let's pray. Father, thanks for this morning. Thanks for the people you love so much. Thank for your presence here. Father, I pray we would encounter you through the ministry of your word. Holy Spirit, come convict of sin. Come convince of the righteousness 
that is available from God through Jesus Christ and of the final judgment, we ask in Jesus' name, if your heart agrees, say amen with me. This year we've been reading through Paul's letters, listening to what the Holy Spirit wants to say to us through them. These are not ordinary letters, they're letters from heaven. They're letters inspired by the Holy Spirit to speak across time and distance to you and to me. Earlier this year, we read Paul's letters to the church at Thessalonica, his first two letters. Then we read his letter to the Christians in the region of Galatia, what is now modern-day Turkey. Now we're reading his first letter to the Christians in the Greek city of Corinth. You know, one of the challenging things about doing what we're doing is that it forces us to look at portions of Scripture that we'd really rather just ignore. It forces us to eat the parts that don't necessarily taste good to us. When Denise serves meals to our family, she carefully plans what's on the plate so that there's a good balance of proteins and grains and carbohydrates and fruits and and vegetables. But you know, everything on the plate is not appreciated by everybody. Rolls and butter are always a big hit, but broccoli is another story. So when Denise puts the plates down, she says to each one of us, including me, you must eat everything on the plate. I happen to like broccoli. You know, the same is true with the word of God. God has put a balance in his book of both promises and prescriptions. God has put a balance of both affirmation and confrontation. He has put a good balance in his book of both encouragement and correction. And we don't get to pick and choose which parts of Scripture we heed and which parts we ignore. We must eat the whole scroll. Jesus said, man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Some are easy to swallow and some are hard to stomach. If I were writing a commentary on 1 Corinthians, I would probably call the next few chapters things that trip us up. Paul talks about all kinds of things that trip us up. He talks about disputes over money. That never happens. Talks about sexual purity. He talks about marriage problems. That never happens. Questions of Christian liberty. What are we free to do as believers and what should we not do? Concerns over congregational finances, cliques in the church. That never happens. Super spiritual church ladies. Why, this old book is just completely out of touch with the things that we address today. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, the issue is church discipline. A brother has fallen into a very grievous immoral relationship with his own stepmother. Paul says even the pagans who are notoriously promiscuous, wouldn't go for this. But the Corinthian church had taken no action at all against the brother. In fact, they were pretty smug about how spiritual their church was in spite of this elephant in the room. And some among them even took pride in the fact that their congregation was so progressive and so free and embracing that a man in this situation could still call himself a member of their church family. Oh, that never happens today. I mean, who ever heard of a church taking pride of the fact that they're so free and open that they can embrace people into their membership who are living unapologetically in a lifestyle that the Bible plainly calls sin? That never happens today. There are issues that we're facing as believers today for which 1 Corinthians 5 provides desperately needed help. How should we as believers think about unbelievers? How should we relate to them? How should we welcome them into our gatherings? And what should we do about members of our church family who fall into or who fall back into patterns of sinful living that belong to the unbelieving world? Paul says what we can't do about that is nothing. As difficult as it might be, we must get wisdom from the Holy Spirit. We must rally together as a church family. We must trust our leaders and we must dare to discipline. 
We must administer loving correction. We must plead. We must pray. We must warn. We must discipline. We must put in order what is out of order in God's house. In the entire history of the church, there has never been another time when church discipline was so woefully lacking as it is today. You know, part of that is the church's fault because of extremes of the past. Some of you have been the recipients of extreme church discipline that wasn't done at all in the spirit of Christ. Maybe more than a few of you took cracks over the knuckles and uh, experienced some hurtful things in the church. I want to say, as a representative of God's house, I'm sorry for that. But listen, the answer to doing it the wrong way is not to stop doing it, it's to do it the right way. But, you know, a lot of it also has to do with the prevailing sentiments in our society and the problem of fatherlessness. In general, discipline is regarded today as unloving. And a lot of people in the church feel that way. They consider any church discipline as harsh, as inconsistent with the love of God. But Paul shows us the contrary in 1 Corinthians 5. He shows us that it would be unloving not to address members of our family who have fallen into a life of sin. Looking at Paul's words here in 1 Corinthians 5, I find five reasons why we must dare to discipline. And I want to share them with you quickly. Five reasons that we must dare to discipline. First of all, because we believers are much more holy than we think we are. In the opening verses of chapter 5, Paul describes the situation and what to do. A brother is having an illicit relationship with his own stepmother. Paul says he must be disfellowshipped. In verses 6 through 8, he explains why. It is because we who are in Christ have undergone a radical transformation. We have been radically cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Passover lamb. Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed and he has removed from us the leaven of sinfulness. In Jewish tradition, the Feast of Unleavened Bread began on the same day that the Passover lambs were slaughtered. On that day, the Jewish people went through their homes and they removed all the leaven, all the fermented dough for bread making. You know, God designed these two symbols to coincide with one another. The lambs are slain and the leaven is removed. The symbol is that it is the blood of the lamb that removes the leaven of sin from God's people. You see, listen to me. This is good preaching. I got a revelation this week, something I never knew. I learned something. I'm going to teach it to you. The blood of the lamb on the doorpost doesn't merely cover the sins of the people inside of the house, but it also removes sin from the house. That's good preaching. That, that's enough to make me happy right there. I'm going to go home happy no matter what else happens today because that's so good. Both Paul and John specifically go out of their way to say that it was on this day of preparation for the Feast of Unleavened Bread that God's Passover lamb was sacrificed on the cross. His blood sacrifice not only covers our sins, but it removes sin from us. The leaven of our sin nature has been removed from us. That natural bent we had towards sinning, that desire for sin, our penchant for sinning has been taken away from us. We are no longer an old batch of leavened dough. We are now a new batch. We are a radical new creation in Jesus Christ. Listen, I, I understand the good intentions. I really do. But I want to tell you, it is totally awful theology to say that the only difference between us and unbelievers is that we have been forgiven and they have not yet been forgiven. It's true, we have been forgiven, but we have not only been forgiven, we have also been radically transformed. People say, oh, you Christians, you all holier than thou. Why, yes, we are. Thank you. 
we were leavened, but now we have been unleavened by the blood of Jesus, and we are not the same as unbelievers anymore. Paul is saying, this is what you are. Now be what you are. That's good right there. Not only have we been radically changed, but we have been set apart as God's pure household. His alternative to the impurity and the brokenness of this world. Earlier in chapter 3, Paul has already told us that we together, we are the temple of God. Literally, the word he uses is we are the holy place and the holy of holies where God's spirit dwells. There are many temples in our city dedicated to many different kinds of idols, but there is only one temple in which the living presence of God may be found, and that is in his church. There is only one temple where purity and sincerity and truth can be found. There is only one temple in our city where someone can come in a leavened lump and someone can leave an unleavened lump by the blood of Jesus. That is his church. So our whole existence now as believers is set apart as an ongoing celebration of unleavened bread. Our whole existence is an unleavened existence. It is an existence of sexual purity, of fidelity, of goodness, of honesty. We have been radically transformed and we have been set apart by God as an alternative in our city. That's why it is impossible not to address a member of our family who has fallen into a lifestyle of sin. Because a member living in sin is a contradiction to what we really are. A member living in sin will prevent us from being God's alternative in our city that we really are. Paul is saying to us, you are much more holy than you think. Now be what you are. Five reasons we must dare to discipline in 1 Corinthians 5. The second reason is because sin is much more deadly than we think it is. You doing all right this morning? All right, I'm going to tell you how it's going to go. It's going to get a little worse, and then you know it always does, and then it's going to get better at the end, okay? So it's going to get worse, and then it's going to get better. Just hold on through the worst, because it'll get better. Sin is much more deadly than we think it is. In verses 6 through 8, Paul explains why we can't just ignore the presence of sin. Beloved, listen, we can't ignore it in our own lives, we can't ignore it in our house, and we can't ignore it in the family of God and the lives of those that we love in the Lord. Because for one thing, sin overpowers. Paul says, don't you know that just a little leaven leavens the whole lump? See, that's the nature of sin. A little bit of sin never stays a little bit of sin. Sin is like Pandora's box. If you open the lid just a crack to see what's inside, you will never be able to control what comes out of that box. Just like leaven silently works its way through a lump of dough, sin deftly overtakes the human will and enslaves it. Sin is uncontainable. It's uncontrollable. It's unmanageable. It's unstoppable. It's not possible to have just a little drinking problem. It's not possible to have just a little pot problem, a little porn problem, a little sex addiction problem, a little gambling problem. You see, Paul says it is the very nature of sin to dominate. Not only that, but sin defiles. As leaven works its way through a lump of dough, it ferments that dough by corrupting it. And that's just what sin does. As sin permeates our being, it corrupts our thinking. It corrupts our emotions. It corrupts our judgment and decision making. It corrupts our speech. It corrupts our behavior. It corrupts our relationships. Sin becomes so entwined in every part of our being that it can't be separated from us. Once a lump of dough has been leavened, how can you possibly go through that lump of dough and unleaven it? Only God could do something like that. And sin not only defiles us, it defiles everyone with whom we have intimate contact. Close friends, family members. The NIV translation uses the word yeast 
instead of leaven because yeast is more familiar to all of us. But actually, leaven and yeast are not the same thing. Yeast always comes from a fresh source, but leaven is passed down from generation to generation of fermented dough. And what an accurate picture that is of the defilement of sin. It travels down our family line, infecting one generation of our family after the next. Addiction, alcoholism, anger, abuse. You know the scientists now, they can study your DNA strand and they can actually see in your DNA strand entities that make you predisposed to certain types of addictions and behavior, anger, alcoholism, that have the alcoholism gene. Can I tell you what they are seeing in your DNA strand is the physical evidence of a spiritual reality the Bible said thousands of years ago. But the sins of the fathers are visited on their children to the third and to the fourth generation. Sin is a gift of defilement that just keeps on giving. It just keeps on infecting one generation of our family after the next. Physical illness, disease, poverty, mental and emotional disorders, dysfunctions of every kind. Generational iniquities become enmeshed into our very family identity and only the blood of Jesus can unleaven that sin out of us. Likewise, Paul says that sin unchecked in a church family has the potential to defile that church family too. Some church families get defiled with the leaven of sexual impurity. Some of them get defiled with the leaven of idolatry. Some of them get defiled with the leaven of gossip, of division, of factions. Sin overpowers. Sin defiles and then sin destroys. Paul says in verse 5 that action must be taken to address the brother who has fallen into a lifestyle of sin so that his spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord. Here's why we can't sit by and do nothing when a member of our family falls into sin or back into a lifestyle of sin because his eternal destiny is at stake. Paul says in verse 13 that a day is coming when God will judge the unbelieving world. But if we expose a backslidden member of our family to judgment in the church now, we can spare him from the fearsome judgment of God in the end. Paul says, what's this I hear? A brother has fallen into a grievous sin. Some of you are just ignoring the elephant in the room, while others of you are actually proud that your church is so open and embracing. But instead, he says, you should have gone into mourning. That word means to grieve the death of a loved one. That's the kind of grief that we should feel when we learn that a member of our church family has fallen into sin. We should mourn for what he has lost already and for what he is in danger of ultimately losing. Beloved, if you want to know the truth, none of us regard sin as the deadly force that it really is. James said, when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. But we learn of our brothers and sisters falling into a life of sin, and we just shrug our shoulders. Gee, that's too bad. Well, his life, it's his choice to each his own. No, Paul says, you ought to grieve for him and then take holy action. One more thing about sin. God cannot coexist with sin. God cannot live with the things that we live with. He cannot tolerate the things that we tolerate. Together, we are God's temple. We are the sanctuary where his living presence dwells. In the Jewish sanctuary, there was a table that was always set with loaves of unleavened bread. You see, leaven, sin, it is not permitted in God's dwelling place. Not then, not now. God's living presence dwells in the midst of us, his people, and leaven is not permitted here. Now listen, that doesn't mean that none of us have sinned this week. John said, if anyone claims he doesn't have sin, he's a liar. 
and the truth isn't in him. We've all sinned. This week, our dog, once again, went through the kitchen garbage. He spread garbage all over the house, and then he got diarrhea from what he ate in the garbage. My kids left the gate open. We don't allow them upstairs. We have a baby gate, and they left the gate open, and he went upstairs, and I don't know how a dog falls down the stairs, but he fell down the stairs, and on his way down, he had a doggy diarrhea explosion all the way down our steps, all over the wall, and he took out the gate at the bottom of the stairs. I sinned this week. I didn't think Christian thoughts. I didn't say Christian things. I did not want God's destiny for the dog. I wanted to expel the immoral dog out of my house. It doesn't mean that we don't ever sin. What it means, listen to me, what it means is that God cannot stay in a house where unconfessed, unrepented sin is flaunted in his face. He can't stay in a house where people ignore his word, where people ignore his holiness. He can't stay in a house where defiant disobedience to his word is not only tolerated, but it is actually celebrated. He can't stay where believers live and act like unbelievers. His, the blood of his only son was given to unleaven us. He can't stick around where we're acting like a bunch of leavened bread. That's why Paul says you must get rid of the old leaven. Five reasons we must dare to discipline in 1 Corinthians 5. Number three, you doing all right? All right, it's going to get a little worse and then it's going to get better, okay? Just warning you. Number three, because unbelievers are in worse straits than we think they are. Beloved, one of the biggest challenges, I think, in the church today is that we don't regard ourselves as very distinct from unbelievers. We see ourselves and unbelievers as too much alike, but Paul says nothing could be further from the truth. For one thing, unbelievers exist in the realm that is under Satan's dominion. Verse 5 of 1 Corinthians 5 is one of the most interesting verses in the New Testament. Paul tells the Corinthians to gather together, assemble together in the name of the Lord. And he tells them, listen, to hand you. It's a good thing this is in the word of God. I'm just the messenger, all right? Just, I'm just telling you what the word says, okay? Don't shoot the... He tells them, gather together, hand the immoral brother over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. Paul uses the same words in 1 Timothy 1. Scholars have debated for centuries, what do those words mean? They don't agree precisely, but they all agree at the very least that the one thing Paul means is that they must excommunicate the man and return him to the realm that is dominated by Satan and his demons. That doesn't mean that he loses his salvation, but he might lose it. That sounds harsh, I know, but lest we doubt whether Paul really meant it, he repeats himself four times in this chapter, expel the brother. You see, as believers, we exist together under the dominion of Jesus. We live under the protection of his mighty wings. We live in the blessings of his ever-increasing economy. We live in the wholeness of his peace, his shalom. Nothing is missing and nothing is broken. We live in the fullness of his joy. We live in his life-giving, empowering presence. In him we live and move and have our being. But unbelievers don't know anything about that. They live under Satan's oppression. They live under his punishing compulsions. They're driven at his frenetic pace in life. They live in a realm where Satan torments their minds, where he taunts their emotions, where he tries their will, where he assaults their relationships, where he makes their bodies sick. Listen, when a believer is placed outside of the community of believers, he leaves the dominion of Jesus and he returns to the dominion of Satan. I've been a believer in Jesus for 40 years. 
I have seen lots of believers change churches, some for better, some for worse. But I have never once seen a believer get closer to Jesus by forsaking the church altogether. I've never once seen a believer become more Christ-like. I've never once seen a believer become more of a worshiper, more of an intercessor, more of an evangelist, more skilled in the word. I've never seen a believer become more joyful in demeanor or more at peace by forsaking the church. And I have to believe, based on Paul's words here, that when someone forsakes the church, somewhere deep inside of him is a longing for what he's missing. The purpose of disfellowshipping the sinful brother is to make him miss home. So that like the prodigal, he has a change of heart and he comes running back to the father with a repentant spirit. The purpose of sending him out is so that he can come back in again with a right heart. Not only do unbelievers exist in the realm of Satan's dominion, but they exist in bondage to their own sin nature. In 1 Corinthians 5, Paul tells us exactly what we should expect of unbelievers. We should expect them to act like unbelievers. We should expect unbelievers to act like unbelievers. And we should expect believers to act like believers. Some days I have to tell you the truth. I get it perfectly backwards. I criticize unbelievers for not acting like believers, and I excuse myself for acting like an unbeliever. I know you never do that, but you're more spiritual than me. <laughs> Paul uses 10 words in 1 Corinthians 5 to describe the sin nature of unbelievers. Immoral, malicious, wicked, greedy, swindlers, idolaters, slanderers, drunkards. He says, if you try to avoid contact with people like this, you would have to leave the world altogether, for this is what all unbelievers are like. But we are radically different because of the blood of Jesus, so we must be different. But the most sobering truth of all about unbelievers is that they exist in grave danger of eternal condemnation. Jesus said the job of the Holy Spirit is to convince the world of the final judgment and the righteousness of God available through Jesus. May you be convinced in your spirit. At first glance, Paul's words maybe give the impression that it might be better to just stay an unbeliever. He says believers get judged by the church, but unbelievers do not get judged. Almost sounds as if unbelievers have a free pass to do whatever they please, but we have to live under all kinds of constraints. But that's not at all the case because Paul says unbelievers are headed for a judgment that is far worse in the end. Beloved, look at me. The purpose of judgment within the church is remedial. The, the purpose is to bring our heart back to a place where it is humble and contrite. So that we're right with God and we're ready to meet with him in the end. The purpose of church discipline isn't to punish people for wrongs they've done, but to prevent them from proceeding any further down a very dangerous path. The purpose is spiritual restoration. A little further down in this letter, Paul says it is far better to be disciplined by this kind of judgment now so that we will not be condemned with the world in the end. I'm happy to report to you that in the case of this particular believer in 1 Corinthians 5, it worked because in Paul's next letter, he writes to us that the man has repented. Now welcome him back into your fellowship. Discipline within the church is remedial. But the judgment that unbelievers are facing is punitive and it is final. When Jesus comes again, all those who have refused to receive him will be punished by him. And the verdict will be final and it will be eternally binding. Why do we need to address believers who have fallen into a lifestyle of sin? Why does it matter if they're living like unbelievers? Because if they do not change course, they will suffer the same judgment as unbelievers. Five reasons we must dare to discipline. Now it gets good. Number four, because our assembly 
has much more authority than we think it does. 1 Corinthians 5 paints a vivid picture of the authority that is present when we are gathered together in Jesus' name. For one thing, our gatherings are much larger than the number of bodies in the room. Take a look around for a moment. Look at the crowd in second service today. I want to tell you that our gathering this morning is much larger than the number of bodies that you see in this room. Paul says, when you assemble together, I am there with you in spirit. Paul doesn't mean that in a cheery, sentimental way like we use it. Gee, sorry, I have to miss the party, but I'll be there with you in spirit. Paul doesn't mean it like that. What he means is that as their father in the Lord, his apostolic authority was literally present in their assembly, even though he was physically absent. The same is true for us. When we are gathered together for worship in the name of Jesus, the spiritual authority of the body of Christ and of the leaders with whom that we're connected are here with us. We belong to the Assemblies of God, the largest Pentecostal denomination in the world. The authority of the Assemblies of God is here with us as we're gathered in Jesus' name. The authority of our presbyter, the authority of our district superintendent, the authority of our denominational leaders in Springfield, Missouri, the authority of the apostolic leaders with whom God has connected us relationally is here with us this morning. Pastor Raymond Mui's body is in Malaysia, but a little bit of his authority is here with us this morning. I don't know where Brian Simmons is in the world today, but a little bit of his authority is here with us this morning. My friend, Pastor Mike Modica, a mentor to me from DeLand, Florida, a little bit of his authority is here with us today. Bishop Tommy Reed is snowed in in Buffalo. I bet he wishes that his body was here today. It's not, but a little bit of his authority is here with us today. Pastor Judy Shaw, Prophet David Wagner, and maybe a little bit of Bishop Chanker Singh is just remaining here in the room. And more than that, the book of Hebrews says that all of heaven's court is gathered here with us today. Cherubim and seraphim are here with us. Ministering angels and warring angels and messenger angels and angels of provision. The great company of the saints are gathered together with us here this morning. Father, may you open the eyes of your servants so that they might see that those who are with us are greater than those who are against us. And in this heavenly atmosphere... We have authority from Jesus to affect outcomes in people's lives, to change the outcomes of people's life on earth. Paul said, when you are assembled together and I am with you in spirit and the power of the Lord Jesus is present, hand this man over to Satan so that his flesh nature, not his body, so that his flesh nature might be destroyed and his spirit might be saved. In other words, Paul is saying, when you gather together, you have authority to do spiritual business. Beloved, listen to me. Here's the message. Be encouraged. Come on, there's an encouraging word about to hit you. When a precious member of our family, when a precious member of our church family falls into sin, we are not without power to do something about it. We have been given authority by Jesus to do something together about it. We have been given weapons of spiritual warfare that are mighty in God by which we might contend for them. Four kings came and they carried away a lot. And Uncle Abraham stood up and he said, Oh no, you didn't. And he gathered up all the men in his house and he went and he overtook with just the people in his house. He overtook four kings and their armies and he rescued Lot and he brought Lot and everyone and everything that belonged to him back into father's house. When the Amalekites carried off David's family from Ziklag and all the families of his fighting men, David stood up and he said, oh no, you didn't. 
And he went and he pursued the enemy and he fought them from sundown one day until sundown the next day and he recovered all that had been taken captive by the enemy. Beloved, listen, may God give you grace to realize that we have more authority than you think we have. We can do that too. We can stop letting the enemy carry off the members of our family. We can stop letting him carry off our brothers and sisters in Christ. We can stop letting him carry off our spouses and our children and our grandchildren. What would happen if we realized that we have the authority to stand up and say, oh no, you didn't, and go rescue them? What would happen if we would grieve for what they've lost already and what they're in danger of losing? If we'd contend for them with fasting and prayer, if we'd go and approach them in a spirit of love and gentleness and humility and tell them that we're contending for their souls. Several years ago, my wife had a cousin who was married and his wife had an affair with her boss at work and they were headed for a divorce. And I remember my father-in-law tears running down his face. I remember him saying, in the old days, this would have never happened. And I said to him, Dad, what would have been different? And he said, the whole church would have come together and we would have fasted and we would have prayed until God did something about it. He's the oldest of five siblings. And so they started a Tuesday morning prayer meeting at his house every Tuesday, fasting and praying for all the children in the family. Do you know that was a few years ago? And now there's only one cousin that's a holdout, but he doesn't have a chance. Every one of those cousins have come back to Christ. Their homes are in order. Their marriages are in order. Their families are in order. They're joyfully serving the Lord. What would happen? Have we realized how much authority that we have? Five reasons that we should dare to discipline. Finally, this worship team, rescue me. Number five, because Jesus is more present with us than we think he is. Paul says, when you're gathered together in the name of Jesus, he is powerfully present with you. Beloved, can I tell you, Jesus is powerfully present with us in this place this morning. Whether you realize it or not, whether you feel it or not, whether you see it or not, I want to tell you, Jesus is powerfully present with us in this room this morning. Recently, through my studies I've become more convinced than ever of what the book of Hebrews calls the cloud of witnesses. That the saints who have preceded us in death are witnesses to the race that we're running here on earth. My old pastor, my father in the Lord, my mentor in ministry, he's home with Jesus now, but he's watching me run my race. Some of the very godly women in my childhood, missionaries who were retired, poured into me. They're home with Jesus, but they're watching me run my race. The mentors that trained Denise and I for ministry, almost all of them are home with Christ now, but they're watching us run our race. Three of my grandparents who love Jesus very much, I know, are watching. And the angels are watching us run our race. Paul said in chapter 4 of this letter, we are on display for the angels. I have to tell you, when that reality really sunk in, you know, I've been in church my whole life, I heard it my whole life, but when that reality really sunk in, this thought came to me, Shazam! I don't really want to disappoint those who have invested so much in me. And I don't want to embarrass the angels. I don't want to conduct myself in such a way that the angels, they have to look away out of embarrassment. There were some angels looking the other way the other morning when I was cleaning doggy diarrhea off my staircase. (laughs) And then the thought came to me, if I don't want to grieve my spiritual mentors or embarrass the angels, how much more Should I not want to displease the one who loved me 
and who gave himself for me and who is always with me. In chapter 6, we'll get there. Paul says that our union with Christ by faith is so intimate that in a way that I can't even explain to you theologically, the members of my body have become like the members of his body. I can't explain it to you, but in some way, in my union with Christ, my hands are like his hands. My feet are like his feet. My voice is like his voice. What my eyes see, his eyes see. What my ears hear, his ears hear. What my mind dwells upon, his mind dwells upon. Jesus doesn't merely have his eye on me from afar. His eye is on the sparrow, but he's not watching me from afar. He is right here with me. And he's right here with you. And he's right here with us. What did Jesus say? Where two or three of you are gathered in my name, I am there. Jesus is present with us even more than we think he is. So let's not celebrate nor even tolerate any sin, any leaven that would grieve him. Get rid of the old yeast so that you may be a new unleavened batch as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Harvest time, be what you are. Would you stand together and would you give Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, a great big praise in this place? Come on, let's give him a great big praise.